Welcome to AP Calculus 1.7b. 1.7b. In the first part, we looked at infinite limits. These are limits where we took um, the limit as x approached some value a, some x value, and the result of that limit was an infinite, uh, either positive infinity or negative infinity. It was an infinite answer. Today, we're looking at limits at infinity. The difference here is that we're taking the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity and seeing what the result is. And we're going to look at this in contrast with this function on the right here. Our limits at infinity or limits as we approach infinity. And uh, that would be as we approach negative infinity, that would go into the left, or as we approach positive infinity, um, going off toward the right of the graph. And limits at infinity, um, limits at infinity is a limit at infinity is a limit in which so limit at infinity is a limit at which uh, x approaches positive infinity or x approaches negative infinity. As we saw, this is going to look like uh, the limit as x approaches infinity of the function will equal something, or the limit as x approaches negative infinity of the function will equal something. And what we're going to find is that uh, there are basically, depending on how you look at it, three or four possible options that we'll get. And we'll see some of those uh, in this graph here. So let's look at our limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. Looking up here, f of x is our function on the left here. As I approach positive infinity, as I uh, go off toward the right end of my graph, look at my positive end behavior, I see that my function is getting closer and closer to this asymptote here, which is at y equals 2. So this limit as x approaches positive infinity would be 2. And you might say, uh, but this uh, this function, this arrow, it seems to be approaching 3. And if it weren't for that asymptote being shown there for us, we might think that 3 was what it was approaching. The asymptote tells us what it's actually approaching, so this would continue to approach. It's going to pass 3, and can you continue to approach the asymptote? The asymptote is at 2. Remember, whenever we have a limit involving infinity, either an infinite limit or a limit as x approaches infinity, we always have an asymptote involved. So my limit as x approaches positive infinity equals 2. How about my limit as x approaches negative infinity? So this would be um, of f of x reading off the left of the graph. And I see again that this is approaching this asymptote here, which is also at 2. So 2 is also my limit as x approaches negative infinity. How about g of x? My g of x graph. On my g of x graph, my limit as x approaches positive infinity, I start reading off the graph toward the right, and I find that it's not leveling off toward a particular value. It is getting closer and closer to this asymptote here. But that asymptote is not a single y value. That asymptote is a slant asymptote, or oblique, and it's continuing to rise. So my function is also continuing to rise as it gets closer and closer and closer to the asymptote. So I would say that my limit as x approaches infinity is infinity because it's heading upward as I go to the right, um, continuing upward. As it gets closer to the asymptote, it is going further and further and further in the positive y direction. And so we are approaching positive infinity. Now I could continue to take this further and further and further and further and further, heading up toward infinity. So my limit as x approaches infinity is infinity. Let's look at the limit as x approaches negative infinity. Same graph, g of x, but now I'm following it off toward the left, my end behavior. And similarly, I see that I'm continuing to go down and down and down, even as I get closer to this asymptote here. So I would say I am approaching 
I would say I am approaching negative infinity. All right, let's take a closer look. This is a graphical uh, exploration of our limits to infinity, but let's see what this looks like analytically. As a little review here, in pre-calculus we talk about end behavior. And we found that end behavior was based on the lead term of a function, basically the highest power in the numerator over the highest power in the denominator. We looked at their coefficients and determined was that positive or negative, and is the resulting function um, an even exponent or an odd exponent. And we found, looking at our kind of some basic functions here, that if we had an odd exponent, such as x to the first or x cubed, my function would have end behaviors that would look kind of like this. And in either case, your cubic function is a little more curvy, and our x to the first is a straight line. But in either case, I would fall to the left, meaning I would approach negative infinity as I went to the left. And on the right, I would rise and approach positive infinity. And if I had an even power, x squared, an even exponent, then my function would look something like this. How large that exponent is kind of determines how wide my function is. And with an even exponent, I would rise to the left and rise to the right. So I would approach infinity in both cases. But if my leading term was negative, that would flip my function vertically. So I would look like this instead. And what was negative would become positive, and what was positive would become negative. Same thing with my even power, negative x squared. What went up now goes down. Using that concept of m behavior, we can start to develop an analytical approach to limits to infinity. Looking at our first function then, our leading term, our term with the highest power is negative 3x cubed. Cubic means that I rise to the right and fall to the left, but negative says I flip that upside down, which means my end behavior as x approaches infinity, as I read it to the right, approaches negative infinity. This function, uh, to find what this would be, I'd start with my negative here. I've got negative x squared times x times x. Uh, that would be a negative x squared is x squared times x times x would be uh, x to the fourth. This is a even power, so it goes up both sides. And it's positive, so it stays up. Nothing flips. So if I were finding as x approaches negative infinity, I would read this to the left, and I'd go, oh, it's going to approach. It's going to approach positive infinity. Our last one gives us division, but we just look at the, the dominating terms of the numerator and the dominating term of the denominator, which would be negative 2x over x which actually cancels out to negative 2. Well, negative 2 is a straight line. It's horizontal. So my limit, either to negative infinity or to positive infinity, this one asks for positive infinity, as I read this to the right, it would just be negative 2. That's my value there. This is what we've done with pre-calculus. But now we're going to say, how can we find our limit at infinity for all types of rational functions, and then how can I justify that using limits, because that's what the AP exam is going to ask for. Not just that we find the limits as x approach infinity, but that I can use this, what I'll find here, to justify the existence of a horizontal asymptote, or when it approaches negative or positive infinity, these give me slant asymptotes. So let's investigate this further. This third example gives us an opportunity to look more deeply at this, but let's look at these two functions graphically and numerically. Graphically, as x approaches positive or negative infinity, 
graphically, as x approaches negative infinity, I approach this asymptote at zero. And as x approaches positive infinity, I approach this asymptote at zero. So my limit to negative infinity would be zero, and my limit to positive infinity would be zero. With g of x, as I approach negative infinity, I approach an asymptote of zero. And as I approach positive infinity, I approach an asymptote of zero. So we see that in both cases, what they have in common algebraically is that we have x in the denominator. And graphically, we find that that leads to an asymptote at zero because that x can't be canceled out and causes it to be undefined there. So I have this asymptote. Let's see our trend as x approaches infinity with a function as simple as 1 over x. If I had function 1 over x, and I wanted to find the limit as x approaches 1 of 1 over x, well, that limit would be 1 over 1, or 1. And my limit, say, as x approached uh, 2 of 1 over x, would be 1 over 2 should be 1 half or about 0 0.5. How about my limit as x approaches 5, 1 over x? That would be 1 fifth or 0 0.2. And we'll do one more. My limit as x approaches 10. 1 over x is 1 tenth or 0 0.1. Now what trend do we notice if this were a table here? What trend do we notice about the values we get out? We got, for x approaches 1, we got 1 out. For x approaches 2, we got 0.5 out. This x approaches 5, 0.2. x approaches 10, 0.1. If I were to take a guess of my limit as x approaches 100, would I expect that result to be larger or smaller than 0.1? My trend shows that as I take this limit, Essentially, as my denominator becomes larger, my value, my limit, grows smaller. And more specifically, it grows closer to 0. My limit as x approached 100 would be 0 0.01. And it would get closer and closer to 0. So in general, what we'll find is that as long as I have a larger value of x in the denominator, and by that, to be more specific, I have a, a larger power of x in the denominator than I have in the numerator. This is an understood x to 0. 1 is greater than 0. That means that my denominator will grow larger faster than my numerator with, will. And when my denominator is large and my numerator stays small, I get closer to zero. Through limits I can say then, quite simply, the limit as x approaches infinity, as x gets larger and larger and larger, of any of um, one over x to some positive exponent, where my larger powers in the denominator, is always going to approach zero. In other words, as my denominator gets bigger, faster than my numerator does, the overall value gets closer and closer to zero. That's going to be very helpful to us when we work these problems. And we find the same thing with negative infinity, and I encourage you to explore that uh, yourself. Try some values, negative 1, negative 2, negative 5, negative 10, and see what happens. Before we continue with the notes, go ahead and take out a blank sheet of notebook paper. And these are three rules from pre-calculus. From pre-calculus for finding horizontal asymptotes and for finding slant asymptotes. These first two examples are going to be horizontal and the last one slant. What we found uh, in pre-calculus is that when I'm trying to find these horizontal asymptotes, I get to look at just my dominating term or my my uh, Leads term can be a little misleading because it's not always written in front. They might give you one where it should be in the front if they were written descending order, but they might not always write it that way. So I like the term dominant term. It is the most powerful term as the highest exponent, and that's how we find our terms that we looked at. 
And what we found is when my highest term in the numerator and denominator were equal, then I can find my horizontal asymptote by taking the coefficients of those terms. So this one would equal 2 over negative 3. So I'd have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 over negative 3. It's y equals because that's telling me what y value my asymptote is going through. Looking back at what we just talked about as x gets larger faster in the denominator, um, we approach 0. We'll also find that here, if I have my higher power on the bottom, if I have my lesser power on the top and my greater power on the bottom, then that means I have a horizontal asymptote at 0. So my horizontal asymptote is at y equals 0. And that's going to be any time my higher power is on the bottom, or my larger power is on the bottom and smaller power is on the top. S over L gives me 0. When they're equal, then I get the coefficients. And then our slant asymptote is going to be when I have the larger value on top, this x squared, my higher power, more dominant term on the top, because as I go to larger and larger values, this is going to become larger and larger. It's going to get further away from zero. It might become larger by approaching positive infinity, or it might become larger by approaching negative infinity, but that's going to give me a slant asymptote. asymptote. And I don't have to say at any particular value, it's going to slant. We could find the slope of that slant asymptote, but we won't um, at this time. It's not asked on the exam. So our slant asymptote, um, because my limit, we'll see in a moment, approaches infinity. So we're going to go back to the worksheet and see how could we find this uh, analytically, not just find them. This is fine. You could use this for a multiple choice question. But on a free response question, you will be asked to justify this using the limit, and we'll see why this is the case. These are nice little shortcuts, but they don't really show us the why underneath. So we'll look at that next. So our key idea here, we're going to connect uh, the last two little side notes that we took. The idea of the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x, and connect that to our pre-calculus shortcuts. And our idea is that we want to take this function and we want to rewrite every term, each term, in terms of a constant over x. And we do that by finding out what is the highest power of x that appears um, in the denominator, highest power of x in the denominator, and we're going to divide every term by that power. And we'll do that the long way this first time, and then we can do it a little bit more slowly next time. But my highest power here is x squared, so I'm going to rewrite this limit and write every term over x squared. So these are these two terms. This came from here. This came from here. And then this one is x squared over x squared. This one is plus 5x over x squared. And this one is plus 6 over x squared. The next thing we can do is reduce these fractions. We can reduce them. Uh, so we have, by the way, we could do this. We divided everything in the top and bottom by x squared. Just like I could multiply top and bottom times 2 if I were trying to find a common denominator. Or I could reduce a fraction, reduce a fraction by dividing everything in the top by 2 and dividing everything in the bottom by 2. What I've done is divide everything in the top by x squared and divided everything in the bottom by x squared. So that's why we can do that. It's not just kind of out of left field. But now I can reduce these. The limit as x approaches infinity x over x squared reduces to 1 over x. 2 over x squared is just 2 over x squared. x squared over x squared is 1. 5x over x squared is 5 over x. And 6 over x squared is 6 over x squared. 
What I've done is now I'm using limits. I have this limit each step of the way. And I'm showing analytically, justifying with limits, that I'm going to get my asymptote, which we'll see here on the graph on the right. What I can do now is take this limit as x approaches infinity. And remember, we said the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x, we get closer and closer to 0. So every term here that has x still in the denominator after it's been reduced approaches 0. This leaves me 0 plus 0 over 1 plus 0 plus 0, which is 0 over 1, which is 0. And if we were to look at the graph as x approached positive infinity, as I approach positive infinity, I'm approaching this asymptote, which is at x equals 0, because down here is negative 1, up here is positive 1, so we're at 0 here. And so we can see graphically what happens with our limit here. Let's check number 2. Call this one number 2. Our highest power of x in the denominator is x squared. So I'm going to first rewrite my limit, dividing everything by x squared. 2x squared over x squared plus 7x over x squared plus 6 over x squared. x squared over x squared plus 5x over x squared plus 6 over x squared. Now I can reduce, and this reduces to 2. That reduces to 7 over x. This reduces to 6, well, it doesn't reduce. It stays at 6 over x squared. This one reduces to 1. This reduces to 5 over x. And this reduces to 6 over x squared. Once I've reduced, I can take my limit as x approaches as x approaches infinity, and we said the limit of any constant over x as x approaches infinity is zero. This gives me two plus zero plus zero over one plus zero plus zero or two. And if we looked at our graph and approached positive infinity. You would see we're approaching this asymptote here, which is at y equals 2. You might say, well, but I can just, I can use that shortcut 2 over 1 and I get 2. And you can do that for a multiple choice question. But you also have to be able to do the justification using limits. You have to show each of these steps in order to justify the existence of the horizontal asymptote with limits. And I promise you there will be a question like that in the free response on the AP exam, and I can promise you there will be a question like that in the quiz and test because we're specifically looking to make sure that you show your work using limits, not just boxing off the answer. You need to go through this particular process, so practice it and become familiar with it. Number three, we divide everything by the highest power in the denominator, so that's uh, by one. And we're going to get x squared over x plus 3x over x plus 2 over x limits as x approaches infinity. If you haven't noticed already, I tend to be kind of bad about always writing my limits over. Uh, and then x over x minus 1 over x. Then we can reduce. This equals the limit as x approaches infinity of x plus 3 plus 2 over x, all over 1, plus 1 over x. Now I can take my limit as x approaches infinity, and anything that's a constant over a power of x approaches 0. But I still have this x left. So as x approaches infinity, this x in the numerator becomes infinity. So I get infinity plus 3 over 1. Well, infinity plus 3 is still infinity, and infinity divided by 1 is still infinity, and so my answer is positive infinity, which tells me I have a slant asymptote instead of a horizontal one. And we can see that on our graph here. As x approaches positive infinity, I'm heading trending toward 
y um, infinity on the y-axis. We're on the next page, and we're working these same three functions, but now as x approaches negative infinity, we're going to see is there any difference. So same approach, this is good practice, fill this in on your worksheet. Dividing everything by my highest power and denominator, highest power is x squared, 2x squared over x squared, plus 7x over x squared, plus 6 over x squared, limit as x approaches negative infinity, the denominator I get x squared over x squared, plus 5x over x squared, plus 6 over x squared. So I've divided everything by the highest power of x in the denominator. Now I can reduce, this equals the limit as x approaches negative infinity of 2 plus 7 over x plus 6 over x squared all over 1 plus 5 over x plus 6 over x squared. When I take my limit as x approaches negative infinity, the limit of anything that's a constant over x still approaches 0. It's approaching it from the negative side, but it's still approaching it. I have no x left for x to approach negative infinity, so there's no substitution left to do. So I have just this 2 over 1 left for an asymptote at x equals 2. And I see that here as I approach negative infinity from the left, I approach this asymptote, which is the same asymptote. I'm approaching it from a different direction, but I'm still approaching the same y value here at 2. Uh, this one, our highest power in the denominator is x. So I'll go ahead and find this. Highest power is x. Limit as x approaches negative infinity of x squared over x plus 3x over x plus 2 over x divided by x over x minus 1 over x. Simplify equals the limit as x approaches negative infinity of x plus 3 plus 2 over x all over 1 minus 1 over x. So I've simplified this now. And I can take my limit as x approaches negative infinity. My fractions with x still in the denominator approach 0. Now I have um, direct substitution, negative infinity for x. I have negative infinity plus 3 over 1. So with this one, negative infinity plus 3 is still negative infinity. And divided by 1 is still negative infinity. And I can see that graphically. As I approach negative infinity, I'm heading down toward um, y equals infinity. So we can see that when we approach negative infinity, it can change the sign of our answer. Uh, whenever we have a slant asymptote, by nature of it being a slant, it can change my sign. So I need to find that separately. But when I did the horizontal asymptote, I actually found the same sign. That's both positive too. Here we're just going to put together what we've discussed so far. Graphically, a limit at infinity as x approaches infinity can yield a horizontal asymptote. A horizontal asymptote. Or a slant asymptote. Okay. In precalculus, we can find these by comparing the degrees of the numerator and the denominator. Uh, numerator and the denominator. Remember, if we had equal over equal, it was the coefficients, ratio of the coefficients. If the larger was on the bottom, small over large, then it would approach zero. And if the large was on top, that would give us the slant, which would be infinity or negative infinity. However, from this point going forward, that pre-calculus way of finding the asymptote is not a viable justification. It is not justification for the existence of a horizontal or a slant asymptote.
when it asks you to show your work or justify your answer using a limit, this is the process that you need to do. You need to show, you can say that y equals c is a horizontal asymptote. Okay? Of the function if and only if, this is the only way you can justify it, the limit as x approaches uh, could be positive infinity or could be negative infinity of the function equals some constant value. And then you have to show dividing each of the terms by the highest power of the denominator. That's the only way you get that justification step. Show the limit and then take that limit using the division. What we can do is go ahead and reduce automatically at this point. So we can save ourselves one step. We'll do that here. Uh, find the horizontal asymptote if it exists and justify your answer using limits. In other words, do that by setting up the limit and take the limit. It's not enough to just start dividing here. I need to write this as a limit. So I'm going to rewrite this. The limit as x approaches will go positive infinity of 5 minus 2x minus 2x squared over 3x squared plus 2x minus 3. And now I can start my steps. I would divide by the highest power of the denominator, which is x squared. And I can go ahead and reduce as I go. 5 over x squared is 5 over x squared. 2x over x squared is uh, negative 2 over x. And 2x squared over x squared is negative 2. 3x squared over x squared is 3. 2x over x squared is plus 2 over x. And negative 3 over x squared is negative 3 over x squared. That one doesn't reduce. Now I can take my limit as x approaches infinity. Everything that still has x in the denominator approaches 0. And I'm left with negative 2 over 3. All of this right here, this was my justification. I have shown how I got my answer using limits. But now I still need to express my answer. All I've said is negative 2 thirds, but is negative 2 thirds alone is not a horizontal asymptote. I need to give that equation. Because my limit as x approaches infinity of the function h equals negative two-thirds. There is my justification. I can say that y equals negative two-thirds is a horizontal asymptote it's a horizontal asymptote of h of x. We can also deal with some situations where we start having radicals, and this throws our asymptotes off a little bit. They're still very easy to find, but this will make a difference. We'll have a difference between x approaches positive infinity and x approaches negative infinity. We'll note that this function f of x on the right here has two different horizontal asymptotes. So as I approach positive infinity, I am approaching one value. And as I approach negative infinity, I am approaching another value because the square root throw things, throws things off. Looking at these limits then, my limit as x approaches negative infinity is approaching negative 2, while my limit as x approaches positive infinity is approaching what? You should easily be able to fill that one in. Now we can look at these uh, square root functions, these root functions analytically. We'll do a few of these. We just When we do it with the positive, it's going to be very similar. But when we work with the negative, we need to watch our work a little bit. The trick here is that the square root of x squared equals x if x is positive. But over here, when I take x approaches negative infinity, then the square root of x will equal negative x because x is negative. So I need to have that it is negative x. We'll go ahead and work this the same. We're going to divide everything by the highest power. The highest power um, on the inside of this radical is x squared. When I take it out of the radical, that means I'm dividing by x outside the radical. So we'll see that here. For the denominator, 
that's going to be x squared over x squared plus 1 over x squared. In the numerator, I'm dividing, take that out of the square root, and that's now an x. So this is 2x over x, which is 2, minus 2 over x. I take my limit as x approaches infinity. Uh, this is 0. This is 0. x squared divided by x is actually 1. And that's 2. So I'm left with 2 over the square root of 1, which is 2 over 1, or 2. Looking at this as x approaches negative infinity, my first step is the same. I go ahead and uh, divide by x squared, limit as x approaches negative infinity, x squared divided by x squared, plus 1 over x squared. But when I take that x squared out of the square root in order to divide in the top, now the, the square root of x squared, if x is negative, is negative x. So I'm going to divide by negative x, negative, uh, sorry, 2x divided by negative x is negative 2. And negative 2 divided by negative x becomes positive 2 over x. I can reduce my x squared over x, just equals 1. Now I can take my limit as x approaches negative infinity. This approaches 0, and this approaches 0. And I'm left with negative 2 over the square root of 1 which equals negative 2. And so we see that that changes our answer sometimes when we take x to negative infinity. Two more problems. Here's our limits. As x approaches negative infinity, highest power is x squared. I'm doing negative infinity, so the square root of x squared will be negative x because x is negative, it's less than 0. So we'll do this a little bit bigger. Limit as x approaches negative infinity. Uh, x squared in the denominator. 2 x squared divided by x squared is just 2. 1 divided by x squared is 1 over x squared. When I take that x squared out of the radical, I'm taking the square root of negative infinity. So it's going to be negative x. So I'm going to divide everything in the numerator by negative x. In, uh, with the 3, 3x three divided by negative x is going to be negative 3. And negative 2 divided by negative x will become positive 2 over x. Now I can take my limit as x approaches negative infinity. Anything that still has a power of x in the denominator approaches 0. And I get negative 3 over radical 2 or I can say negative 3 radical 2 over 2. For this function, x is approaching negative infinity, so the square root of x squared will equal negative x because x is negative. We'll go ahead and rewrite this limit. x approaches negative infinity. Highest power in the denominator is the square root of x squared, so we can rewrite our fraction. Uh, 3x squared over x squared is 3. 2 over x squared is 2 over x squared. But when I go to divide in the numerator, I'm dividing by the square root of x squared, and that's going to be negative x, so I'll divide these by negative x. x squared divided by negative x is negative x, negative x, and 2x divided by negative x is negative 2. Now I can take my limit as x approaches negative infinity. Anything with x still in the denominator approaches 0. And I have an x left, so I would do some direct substitution, and I'm going to plug negative infinity in here. That's going to give me at negative negative infinity is positive infinity, minus 2 over radical 3. Positive infinity minus 2 is still positive infinity, and dividing that by radical 3 is still positive infinity. And my answer is positive infinity, which tells me that I'm going to have a slant asymptote, a slant or a oblique. And that's it.